afternoon. Welcome. You are listening to the Labor Forum here on WRFG 89.3 FM. We're broadcasting out of the Little Five Points Community Center, and uh, we want to welcome all of you who are listening on your radios on your way maybe to or from work. Those of you who are listening on your computer at www.wrfg.org, and of course you can get an app for your mobile device. I want to say that we are not live streaming today, but this program will be able to be seen on the Labor um, Forum YouTube channel um, as we are videoing it. And, uh, so check it out later when you get home. You can see who's in the studio with me. Uh, my name is Diane Mathewitz, and I'm a retired auto worker. I want to welcome and say hello to the team of the Labor Forum. Hey, Kenya. Good afternoon, Diane. And Paul. Good afternoon. So everyone, uh, Kenyon is a um, member of the um, Postal Workers Union, and Paul is uh, with the Amalgamated Transit Workers Union. And we're going to have a super show again, as always. Uh, the opinions that are expressed on this program, though, are those of the people who make them, and not necessarily those of the Board of Directors, staff, or volunteers here at WRFG. I want to remind everyone as well that starting next week, next Monday, we will be in the summer pledge drive for WRFG. This is the main way that WRFG stays on the air and we particularly hope that those of you who enjoy listening to the Labor Forum will make a financial contribution over the next three weeks starting June 30th. Uh, and you can do that either by going online, making a donation over a secure website there, or you can call in starting next Monday and uh, we will be glad to take your pledge on this program or any of the programs 24-7 here at WRG. So, you know, we have a new format here. We are going to start our program off each week with what we call labor headlines. So, Kenyon, you want to tell us what's happening around the world with working folks? Yeah, I sure do. Uh, well, today's headlines come from South Africa, Puerto Rico, and Washington State. Uh, for almost two years, miners who worked for the giant companies Anglo-American Platinum, Impala, and Lum, extracting precious metals essential for automotive and transport industries have been engaged in a series of work stoppages in the Rutenberg area of the northwest province of South Africa. The current strike began in January 2014. The main issue is wages. Miners are demanding a pay increase to raise their monthly wages to just over $1,100 a month from the roughly $600 they now receive for the most dangerous work. Dozens of miners have been killed by company security forces as well as provincial police since the struggle began in August of 2012. The most horrendous massacre happened on August 16, 2012, when 34 striking miners were mowed down by police fire, with many more being wounded and dozens arrested. Miners are meeting today to consider the recent proposals by the mining companies. Despite the end of white rule in South Africa, also known as apartheid, the country's vast wealth is still controlled by a handful of corporations, many of which are British or U.S. owned. Sections of the South African working class are demanding the nationalization of many industries, including the gold and platinum mines. Meanwhile, in Puerto Rico, which is also a colony of the U.S., public sector workers are especially under attack by austerity measures being considered by the legislature. The Financial Sustainability Act, which grants emergency powers to the government to renegotiate all public worker contracts, freeze salaries, eliminate unused sick days, privatized the island's electrical company and closed 100 schools. By law, the budget has to be passed by June 30th of this year. Workers have been engaging in a number of actions, including mass protests and work slowdowns to oppose the anti-labor, anti-people legislation. A general strike may be in the offer. Interestingly, the same law firm, Jones Day, which is leading the Detroit bankruptcy plan, which cuts the pensions of city workers to pay off debt to the banks, is also involved in Puerto Rico's financial crisis. And lastly, farm workers in Burlington, Washington, scored a big victory against Sakuma Brothers, Sakuma Brothers, I believe I pronounced that right, Sakuma Brothers Farms, winning $850,000 in unpaid wages owed workers who harvested strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries between October 23rd of 2010 and December 31st of 2013. The settlement also includes improvements in working conditions and employment policies. Thanks a lot, Kenyon. So that's just a little bit of what's going on with our working class brothers and sisters around the world. All of us struggling yes. for decent wages. Yes. 
safe working conditions. Want to record a lot of so uh, we'll go to our next segment, which is with uh, Paul McLennan. And Paul has been bringing us such interesting, um, I don't know, not stories isn't the right words, uh, accounts of uh, labor history. And we have another one today. So Paul, uh, what do we got? Okay, uh, this was a pretty important day, especially for uh, workers in the South. Uh, on June 23rd in 1947, the Labor Management Relations Act was passed over the veto of President Harry Truman. Called the Taft-Hartley Act after its main sponsors, the law monitors the activities and power of, local, of labor unions. The Taft-Hartley Act revised the National Labor Relations Act of 1935. It was seen as a means of demobilizing the labor movement. The law was promoted by large business lobbies, including the National Association of Manufacturers. Labor leaders at the time called it a slave labor bill, and 28 Democratic members of Congress declared it a new guarantee of industrial slavery. The act banned the closed shop, permitted the president to order cooling off periods before strikes in critical industries, and prohibited strikes by federal employees. It banned radicals from union leadership. It also allowed the president, when he believed that a strike would endanger national health or safety, to take measures to seek a federal court injunction to block or prevent the continuation of the strike. What is most relevant to us in the South was the section of the law that allowed states to exempt themselves from union requirements, so-called right-to-work laws, which really mean lower wages and benefits for everyone. To understand why this law was passed, we have to look at what was happening in the labor movement. During the 1930s, hundreds of thousands of workers began organizing in the new mass production industries like auto and steel, particularly through the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO. To stabilize the system, in face of all the labor unrest, the Wagner Act of 1935, setting up a National Labor Relations Board, was passed. Most workers now had the legal right to organize. Southern states were fiercely against this. So as a concession to Southern Democrats, President Roosevelt excluded the majority African-American sectors of agricultural and domestic work from this labor protection. Needing their support to pass his legislation, Roosevelt was reluctant to intervene and enforce the law. The white supremacist anti-union rule of the southern white elite went unchallenged. Blatant violations of the law and vigilante violence against union organizers continued. In the post-war economy, controls on prices and profits were lifted, and in response, the largest strike wave in American history shook the nation in late 1945 and much of 1946. People had come back from World War II expecting more. Organizing 800 new locals with 400,000 members, the CIO doubled its southern membership in the first year and a half. Black workers and radicals played a key role in many of these victories, but the campaign to organize the South failed for many reasons. One reason was the opposition of the business owners, who quickly went to work to pass these right-to-work laws. These were the same forces that were also in favor of denying African Americans their democratic rights. In the 1950s, business owners across the South organized white citizens' councils that were really a front for the Klan. Anti-union employers used race hate to weaken unions. In Louisiana, for example, segregationist business leaders introduced an openly organized support for right to work. The struggle of black workers to organize at the workplace could not be separated from the struggle for basic human rights denied to African Americans, especially in the South. This freedom fight became a powerful force in the struggle for unionization, but it went beyond that and had the potential to transform Southern society. The history of political disenfranchisement of African Americans is central to telling the story of the labor movement in the South. The two cannot be separated. Whether it is right to work laws or the electoral college, the interests of democracy are not served because they both deny the will of the majority. Successful unionization of the South would have most likely hastened
the civil rights movement by many years. A section of white workers could have been won over and would have been part of a successful merger of the labor and emerging black freedom movement. Instead, the road was paved for the Republican Party's southern strategy and the racial appeals to, to traditional white working class Democratic voters. We still live with this legacy of divide and conquer today. And actually, uh, I think last week when we were talking about uh, uh, labor headlines, right. we actually had a, the instance of, uh, situation of, the, in <laughs> of the transit workers in uh, Philadelphia who, uh, whose strike was essentially halted as a result of Taft Harbor. Right. So it uh, lingers on big time in uh, making it hard for workers to really uh, show their power. Because as the song that we always start the program off is, we do the work. <laughs> and if, the, if we're not being treated right, you know, we shouldn't be doing the work, and we should stop it. Uh, folks, uh, we have a super show today. We're going to have uh, two more segments. Um, and the first one is going to be about the MARTA workers and their struggle to get a decent contract. And Paul, as a former MARTA worker, retired now is going to lead that interview with our guest who's here in the studio and his name is Mark Fitzgerald and we'll have that interview and then we're going to segue into uh, actually it's going to be a two-part discussion that's going to take place here on the Labor Forum uh, starting today and then concluding next week and that is of course uh, this whole issue of how public funds seem to just like not just in Atlanta but just all over the world uh, like Brazil keep getting used for the benefit of for-profit organizations, sports teams, etc. So we'll have that conversation after we finish with Mark Fitzgerald. So you want to have that introduce him a little more, Paul? Okay. Um, well, thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, Mark Fitzgerald is a uh, member of the Amalgamated Transit Union and, a, and a, an executive board member of Local 732. Um, I was wondering if you could start, Mark, just by saying a little bit about the union and who it represents and the work that uh, transit union workers provide. Hi, hi. Um, we've been working to try to organize our workers and get a contract with the company for almost a year now, a good part of a year, and uh, we've been able to get uh, not very far with this. Um, we represent the drivers, the train operators, the mechanics in both rail and bus. I would personally represent the bus mechanics. I've been an executive board member for close to nine years now, coming, coming up on nine years. Uh, we're working to represent the station agents. We work to represent the people in infrastructure. We work to represent thousands of employees throughout the MARA system get a fair contract, which has been extraordinarily difficult given this uh, hostile work environment we've been facing. Um, you mentioned to me earlier about the issue of unfair labor practices. Can you talk a little bit about that? What that is? Mm, yes. Or an example? Yeah, unfortunately um, it's a tactic that uh, companies often engage in when they're going to contract negotiations in order to put pressure on the membership. And we're seeing it now worse than ever. I've worked for this company for 15 years now, and this is the worst that I've seen it. Um, we see the company routinely writing up policy on its own without negotiation with the union. This is a violation of our contract. We see unjust discipline on the employees, case after case after case. We've had to go to arbitration in order to get fair results because the company refuses to go through the collective bargaining process, the grievance procedure, and it's a huge waste of financial resources to take cases to arbitration that we know don't need to go to arbitration and the company just needs to follow its own rules and the rules of the contract it signed. They waste thousands and thousands of dollars by having employees out on administrative leave for almost a year and keeping them out, paid, doing nothing while they so-called investigate a case. There are numerous examples of wasted money. So how, how would you say this, um, the union had, has a relationship with the 
community in terms of an issue like this, in terms of the waste of taxpayers' money? Well, it's it's very important to the community. It's it's key. Um, all this money that the company wastes, all this job, these jobs that are eliminated from the workforce, uh, the services that are cut back, this impacts the community even more so than the workers. The workers are just part of it, but the community is the much much larger part of it. There's so many more people when when. A person can't get to their job because the route has been cut, or they can't get to a doctor's appointment, or they can't get to where they need to go because the company is cutting back on service and cutting back on routes. It affects the public. I mean, this is a huge sector. Um, it affects the economy. Plus, there's also the issue of unsafe buses. We've just had a paratransit van that burst in the flames. We had issues with the condition of our buses, the brakes on our buses are in atrocious shape and we've tried time and again to bring this to management's attention, but it's going to take accidents and lawsuits and there's your waste of taxpayer money and hope to God nobody gets killed. So um, one of the questions that we've talked a lot about here, especially with Kenyon and the postal workers, is the issue of privatization. Can you right. say a little bit about that? Right, privatization, that's the big theme that seems to be hitting everybody. That's all over the board, all over the country now, and we've been watching what's going on with the postal workers, and we see the same trends happening in our company as well. They, uh, they eliminate jobs, and then they contract the work out under the guise of getting it done faster and cheaper, and in reality, they're paying two to three times more what they can do, what we can do it for, and the product that they're getting back is inferior service. This is by non-union workers then? Yes, yes. This is by, by companies that aren't equipped to do the same work that we do. Um, there's safety concerns in there. There's all kinds of stuff. Um, and this seems to be a national trend. This is going on all over. Um, one thing that I've heard from the president of our international, Larry Hanley, is that he's really stressed the importance of our union organizing riders. Um, what do you think the vision should be um, for Local 732 going forward in terms of working with the community? Well, that's an absolutely necessary piece. It, it can't move forward. We can't win this battle without the riders. Like I said earlier, the riders are the largest piece of this puzzle. Um, they're the people who are most impacted by the cuts. They are the largest number of people out there. And if the riders can get organized and we can demand fair service, safe service, and on-time service, then we can make some serious impact in the direction that MARTA goes in the future. Um, it's all linked together. We have a ridership campaign where we're trying to reach out to the communities and educate them about what things that the company is, is getting ready to do and how it's going to impact them and we're trying to get support, as much support as we can from the community, educate them and get as much support from them because we've got some serious battles coming up. Uh, the state legislature comes back into session and uh, we've had some very negative legislation thrown at us in the past. And you're still working? And we are still working on the contract a year into it. And it's been how many years since you've gotten a raise? <laughs> um, it's been, I'm ashamed to admit this, but it's been going on 10 years since we've had any raise whatsoever, including cost of living, anything like that. Um, the company's found ways to choose a lot of paychecks through increased medical deductions and any other type of cost they can defer on to us. I don't know any other industry out there that has suffered through 10 years without any type of a cost of living raise. If you think about what the cost of gas or groceries was 10 years ago, our paychecks is hard to stretch. I want to ask a question if I can, because it seems to me that one of the things that happens with literally every public service is that, uh, is that the management either, as you said, cuts cuts the staff, cuts the hours, whether, whatever it is. So the, in other words, the c consuming public, the public then gets irritated. The lines are long, the wait for the bus is long. And, it, and then it's posed that the problem is this greedy or lazy or non-working worker 
that's creating all the problems for whatever the public service is. And I, I think again that when people hear that on the news, it, uh, I was just watching the other night uh, a local television station that had to do a big segment on a worker who was at City Hall that they found during his break with his eyes closed taking a short nap. And this TV station made this seem as though this was the crime of the century and that this was the reason why, you know, taxes in Atlanta are high or whatever. And I it was I was so angry about this because again, <laughs> you think of the salaries of the management, you think of the waste of what you just talked about with needlessly going into grievance procedures when they should just handle the issues. And yet uh, the corporate media, the bosses obviously, are always trying to push the issue off on that it's somehow the worker's fault for this not happening. So I just wanted to ask you again, I think like with the postal workers, um, people who ride a bus or uh, regularly know their driver? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. So I think this again is a situation where um, we really here on WRFG's labor forum and elsewhere have to really make it clear that when that it's our neighbors, the people we know, that management always wants to disrespect and call out, and uh, that that we really need real solidarity. So I just wanted to say that from the standpoint of the labor forum, obviously anything we can do for any worker who is under attack by Thank you. bosses and corporations. Here we are for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your time and uh, to come in today. And I hope as we go forward, especially around the contract negotiations, that you need to come in and update us on anything that's happening. Uh, more than welcome. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been wonderful being here. And it's been wonderful meeting all of you. Thank you. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. No. Transit is such a big issue <laughs> here in Atlanta. I mean, it is. it is one of the worst cities to drive in, and I just saw again how um, I believe it's a Cobb County where they just decided that they're not going to try to spend a big bunch of money to um, do a bus a rapid transit. Mm -hmm. yeah. you have a do you have any more information about that or any opinion about that or why it is that uh, there's such an emphasis on building a new road and, and such disparagement of public transit? Why does, why does public transit get such a bad rap? Why does public <laughs> transit get such a bad rap? That would be an entire show unto itself. There's a long history here in Atlanta of, of discriminating against public transit. Uh, for the longest time since Marta was created, there was a uh, language in the bill that created Marta that said the 50-50 split. Uh, half of its money was spent on operating, and the other, other half was spent on uh, capital. Capital. That's right. And that was done in order to handcuff Marta and keep it from growing too quickly. And that's why today we only see a north-south, east-west rail line, whereas other cities our size they have a much more robust transit, and, and it, it makes a lot more sense. Atlanta is decades, decades behind other cities when it comes to transit. I just want to say, as somebody uh, who, uh, who was here with, during those uh, first elections uh, when the vote came, and this is another thing that just drives me personally nuts, and that is that how it is that the representatives from counties who do not pay into the MARTA tax somehow get to decide where the rail lines, where the bus lines, what the schedule is. I don't know whether they're the ones who are the ones who are the most uh, hostile to unions. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But how is it that the MARTA board is so, um, I don't want to say dominated, but because I don't know but is influenced by people who, for decades now, have never contributed a dime to MARTA, have disparaged it, and yet they get to decide. That's, Talk about something not being democratic. That's very not democratic. That goes back to no taxation without representation, if you, if you ask my opinion. Why should people who are not paying into the system be able to dictate what 
routes and where the buses go and how the people are served, it was it was Fulton County that paid into this system billions of dollars over the years to build it, to fund it, to, to run it, but these other, just like you said, these other state legislators, they just want to have a say in how everything runs and it's only for their own interest. It seems to me that it's so logical that one of the things that we should be pushing for is that this MARTA board should be reconstituted and very clearly Agreed. there should be worker representatives and transit rider representatives on it. We Agreed. are we, we do the work and we do the riding. And we <laughs> should make the decisions. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Mark, and thank you, Paul, for arranging this interview. I know that uh, you went to the demonstration this uh, morning. And it didn't happen. It didn't morning. happen, so we'll but talk about it with it. us. <laughs> yes. All right, we're going to take a short break, and uh, we're going to come back with our next two guests. And we're going to talk about um, how it is that so much public money, and in now in the city of Atlanta, uh, historical churches, neighborhoods, just get ravaged all for the cause of a using public money for privately controlled stadiums and sports teams. And that'll be a lively topic with our next two guests. So Anita Baby is coming up and she is uh, the director of the task force for the homeless. And Kenneth Howell, he also is going to join us and he is uh, with the uh, Cobb County, he's out in Cobb County, he's with the Georgia Community Coalition. He's also a member of ATU Local 732. So stay tuned. Uh, we're going to have this brief message and then we'll come back to this lively conversation about sports, the public interest. back. Um, friends, you are listening to the Labor Forum here on WRFG. Uh, you're tuned in to 89.3 FM on your radio and also on www.wrfg if you're listening on your computer. And uh, likewise, on your mobile device, you can get an app and take WRFG with you wherever you go, the whole wide world, wherever you can tune in to the Labor Forum on Mondays from 4 to 5. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we watched the huge demonstrations that took place and are still taking place in Brazil over the expenditure of really billions of dollars uh, in a country that has extraordinary poverty. Uh, we have two guests here uh, who are also very familiar with how it is that the expenditure of literally millions of dollars of taxpayer dollars, but not only just the, the money, is where the stadiums get put and the impact they have on a whole variety of interests of working class people. Uh, they're both familiar with that, both from the past and in the present. So uh, Kenyon and I are going to be uh, leading this interview with our two guests. Uh, Paul has moved to the corner, <laughs> but he certainly can come over anytime he has a question. Um, so let me first start by asking Anita and uh, Ken to please give us a little more information about yourselves, but mainly why and how it is that you are interested in this topic. And if you don't mind, we'll start with Anita. Hi, Diane. Thank you. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here. My name is Anita Beatty, and um, I'm the, I say I'm the executive director of the Metro Atlanta Task Force, but the task force directs me. <laughs> For sure, um, this this topic interests me because of the history in uh, this city of our local government spending enormous amounts of taxpayers' dollars on projects that were not only not necessary but not called for, and to the exclusion of um, dealing with the housing needs of hundreds of thousands of homeless people over the last decade. We say there are probably. 5,000 homeless people in the metro area over a year's period. So we lose in a battle in terms of housing, but we have uh, a belt line coming up and uh, trolleys and uh, other projects and a big stadium moving. So it's a really critical and crucial topic. Ken, uh, Ken Howell, you are currently involved in the 
the controversy, we'll call it, out in Cobb County. Um, if you wouldn't mind uh, giving our listeners a little bit more of a background about how and why you're interested or how it is you got engaged in this issue. Well, <clears throat> uh, I am the, the a transit advisor to the Georgia Community Coalition as well as the community liaison uh, for the Amalgamated Transit Union with the community. Our President uh, Larry Hanley had uh, put membership as well as leadership to task to become more community involved because our unions had at one time been more secluded into our own concerns but our membership comes from the community. People we serve come from the community, so it is best for us to work within our own community. The Georgia Community Task Force, uh, Georgia Community Coalition, is a coalition of several organizations. The SCLC the, uh, is one of the organizations uh, in Cobb County that is also a part of the the uh, coalition. We're working on different uh, fronts trying to bring attention to labor and labor needs as well as education in our communities. Okay, so um, listeners, uh, we just couldn't help uh, reflect as we were watching these huge demonstrations that took place at the opening of the World Cup. And uh, this is sometimes a topic where a lot of workers are big sports fans. Big, big, big sports fans. Many of them can never afford, of course, to go to these stadiums and pay the prices of the tickets. But nonetheless, watch the games and, and wear the shirts and buy the merchandise and follow teams of all different kinds. Baseball, football, hockey, basketball, and soccer, and others. Um, rapidly. So it, some people might say, don't you be touching my baseball stadium and don't you be messing with my football team. But we wanted to talk about this because it isn't, I, I, we want to talk about this because the impact that happens on a community is the same place where all these workers are gathering to watch these sports, sporting events. And it's really important in this period that we talk on the program all the time about privatization, about how public money is just getting moved, moved, moved into the pockets of just a few corporate individuals, whether it's in Atlanta, Brazil, wherever it's happening. So I'm going to ask this question um, a little bit. How is it, Anita that, and, and Ken, that you would describe to somebody who's a rabid fan, a real fervent fan, um, what the, what the, what, who should be paying for a stadium and where should it be put? <laughs> it really is a difficult issue to educate people about because emotion is so important to sports fans. And you know, it's sort of like when we, when we won the game, the bid for the games, I think it was 91, people went just nuts and it, it was impossible to have a sensible conversation with even really progressive people to say wait a minute we know what's happened historically all over the globe when big events come to a city people's housing is destroyed people who don't have housing are arrested you know there's a history progressively all over the globe so you know it's it's sort of you talk to a glazed look and so we were during the lead up to the Olympics and you know it's almost 10 years of planning all of it was done secretly it was done privately so the government was not officially sponsoring the Olympic Games in Atlanta and that happens most of the time here with these projects the government is not doing it the private sector is doing it with government money and the government money is insuring the risk so, I mean, the money's going into the pocket. When, when the aquarium was planned, we knew what went on. It, that all of the, uh, the tax incentives and the downright cash commitments to that aquarium, to say nothing of the ordinances that were passed because of Reverend Marcus wanted them to be in order to 
guaranteed that he would put in a grave. So it was a deal done before we even began to know what was coming down the pipe. It's very difficult to get into that conversation and to persuade the voters that you can't, I mean, there's no way to get to these private folks, but there is a way to get to the elected officials who are in their pockets. Well, that leads us right into Cobb County. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the Braves deal. And I think every element that uh, Anita mentioned there, secrecy, nobody knows about it, commissioners who uh, rubber stamp things, uh, that's what it looks to me anyway. So, uh, Ken, what's, what's the deal out in Cobb County with the Braves Stadium, and what impact is it going to have, really, on Cobb citizens and residents? A good deal gone bad. Good deal gone bad. It was taken away from the community when the commission took it upon themselves to to work and go undercover, working with people from outside of our community to work with the Braves to bring a stadium in. We are now at task for almost four hundred million dollars. It started at, I think it was 367 million, but with the new proposals that, that, that have came about the last month or so, we're looking at $400 million. And to show you how outraged we can get, in May, we went to a meeting with Braves Community Outreach Team. And this team is the one that you, you that you apply to to get uh, grants for organizations in your community. So for in 2013, they distributed less than $175,000 to community outreach. But yet you are coming into my community and you're asking for 400 million and you've only got 175,000 to give to the community, that's an outrage. It's an outrage, and the grants go to nonprofits. So, I mean, it's a tax write-off either way. I mean, come on, give me. <laughs> and this team was so well coached that they told you, we don't have any money. We just don't have any money. I don't, whoo, it was an outrage. It was an outrage. But at any rate, what, what we're seeing is they're contracting out the work and the work is uh, the uh, company that has it is Bassfield Gore which is a company that does real good you know they hire from a lot of labor they hire from a lot of the uh, IBEW and it, not nothing can be said bad about this company but what we have asked from the uh, community as the Georgia Community Coalition, we want to develop careers. And the only way that we can do that and have steady work for our community members is to start vocational training. We, as a country, have lost the skilled crafts. We have lost cement finishing. We have lost bricklaying. We have lost carpentry. We have lost electrical wiring. We have sent everybody to college and nobody knows how to do nothing. <laughs> These are good paying jobs and they are skilled jobs, but we don't teach it anymore. We used to have it in the high schools, but back after segregation, all that, after integration, all that went away. So we've lost the skill crafts and people were complaining in car when they were putting down the new sidewalks that there, there was nothing but Hispanics working on the sidewalks. Well, the question is, do you know how to lay concrete? No. Well, then that job is not for you. You know, we've got to start to develop these skills in our, in our neighborhoods. Everybody is not college material. Everybody doesn't want to have, have a desire to go to college. Or can but afford it anyway. Or can afford it. <laughs> right. 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 But what, we're, what we as the Georgia Community Coalition 
is working on, along with the uh, Family Restoration Center out in Mableton, is developing a vocational training program with the IBEW as the trainers to bring uh, people into their apprenticeship program, as well as uh, we're developing a program for soft skills because pe uh, people going in that program have to be qualified. And to qualify, they have to have driver's license. You know, we have to get these things. You'd be surprised how many 18, 19, 20-year-olds don't have driver's license. And we're just going through uh, developing this program. And Ken, if you could, you raise an interesting point. And everything you said is absolutely true. Uh, student loans these days, <laughs> 10, 15 years down the line, you're paying for them. What do you get out of it? How to move money from one place to another? That's pretty much it. But going back to what you said earlier about the uh, $400 million, where originally did it start as far as uh, the money that was given or allocated toward the Braves uh, to move into Cobb County? You said it had reached what they were asking for, $400 million from the from this. We really, as a community, we really don't know where it started. We, the newspapers gave us a story that said three hundred and was it 367000 a million, excuse okay. me, 367 million was what the newspapers have had. But I, I've been to the commission meetings, I've been to meetings with commissioners, I've never heard a set figure. A concrete number. Yeah. Well, that's because I think uh, as all these uh, so called agreements happen, uh, yes. there's, they, are, they keep expanding. Well, and well. there's always things that aren't uh, out in the open. Right. right the first and maybe find out about it two three years later well, and then all of a sudden well, well that's where the, the points i want to bring up because it, the same as you said diane they escalate well this is before construction has started and anybody who knows anything about construction once they start you got all kind of extra money that comes into play so if this made it to 400 million now what happens once they actually start the construction of the state? Oh, it was 405 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to take in the infrastructure. Now we're going to take in the BRTs. BRTs are bus rapid transit. Okay. Instead of putting light rail or heavy rail, which is really too expensive, in Cobb County, we are running bus rapid transit. And the plan is for it to run from uh, up North Cobb and uh, Kennesaw, down through Marietta, Smyrna, up on 75, and to Atlantic Station, Art Center, and back out. Now, BRT is a double bus, you know, like the accordion in the middle, but it's updated, you know, so it's good transportation, it's on wheels, it's not on rails. If we need to modify it and move it around, you know, that can be done. One good thing that came out of it, however, why did we have to build a $400 million stadium in order to get decent transportation <laughs> in Cobb County? <laughs> uh, I want to bring Anita back into this because, um, because the Olympic experience is a rich history for uh, those who are working around the issue of the Falcon Stadium, which again, many people are rolled their eyes, and yet uh, it didn't seem as though any public opposition, even the presence of two historic black congregations, uh, which should have been protected and saved by any conscious community, um, just got rolled over. And uh, now very clearly the situation of what's happening with the the Braves Stadium as well. If you were uh, had an opportunity, Anita, to speak to any of the opponents, uh, what are the lessons that you think from the '96 Olympics experience um, that you offer them? Well, I think it was the it was the dress rehearsal or the dry run for this complete private developer takeover of our city and our metro region. I mean, it, it, we've seen it coming. Many of us have followed the privatization um, um, steamroller, have seen this coming. And now elected officials are just sort of shills. You know, they, they are doing the bidding of in the 
downtown area of Atlanta, Central Atlanta Congress writes the policies, or has done in the past. I understand they cannot be such a big thing right now. But the private sector, the development and local business folk are writing public policy, and they weren't elected to do that. So we thought that after the Olympics and leading up to the Olympics, the, um, the Super Bowl, World Series and all of those big events, which we've always seen, give the opportunity to the city to sweep people out of sight. And then for the Olympics to tear down housing, 10,000 units of housing were eliminated that people lived in. And then, you know, by 2005, when the Atlanta Housing Authority wanted to privatize everything, who was left to follow? You know, 9,600 human beings were in those units. I think it was 3,200 units that were done away with. That was all that was left by 2005. So, you know, it's hard to organize among the folks who are at such risk because they have so much at stake. Um, their lives, their place of living, you know, to say nothing of jobs. It scares people to death to raise their voices because they will be It's twofold. It's it's the rise of the private sector and the complete control over our public lives by private for-profit businesses and very wealthy people. It's the same thing that's happened in this nation. And um, the, the pop, it doesn't matter what party you're affiliated with, if any. You know, it's the same story from the top to the street. I want to uh, follow if I could. This is a program, you know, directed towards working people, and, and very clearly a lot of workers are interested in sports. But the issue of the day is jobs. And so I, wanna, I want both of you to address this issue. Um, it's often said, well, don't you want all these jobs? That, they just, that, <laughs> I just <wish. laughs> So there's the construction jobs. They say that there's going to be all this development, you know, that takes place, more jobs. I want you both to address the issue of, yes, there are jobs, but what jobs are they and how long do they last? Oh, my goodness. Uh, you I mean, there was nothing. I'm going to call, too, because I know, I remember, I think I remember, I'm 72 and I don't remember so much, but before the Olympics, we, you know, generally the thought was, yay, and so we paid a visit, a bunch of us, union people and some of the rest of us, to the ACOG headquarters. We did, we did stimulate some jobs there because they had no security when we walked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true. We just, we just went in. I think we were there. Really we went in two days or three days before Christmas in that year, and we were just polite. We went, we said, we want to talk to Billy Payne right now, please. I mean, we said, please, and everything. We did not storm in. We walked in as a group of about 95 people. And we scared them to death. I, I mean, nobody stormed. Nobody banged on anything. We just went in and waited. And then they sent us, uh, Mayor Young and future Mayor Franklin, as as the emissaries. The emissaries. And to call them. To call them. To call them. The the crowd. Crowd. <laughs> and so they were always sent in to calm us down and to say, just you know, y'all, we will listen, we'll take your ideas. And we said, no, 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 we want to speak to the man. Well, the next time we went in, there were so many security people there that I remember Tim McDonald said, you're welcome for your job. You're welcome for your job. <laughs> All the way up the steps to get into the meeting. So that might have been some of the few jobs, those were some of the few jobs that were actually created. But something like 84,000 jobs were promised for the Olympics. I don't know how many actually came about, but they were part-time. They were of short duration. People migrated here and became homeless because they came for the jobs. They came, and the, you know, I keep, we keep saying to these folks on the other side, everybody reads your public relations material when you go and have a, a, a world event like this. People come here for a better life. They think they're going to get a job and cheaper housing, and they get stuck here because they didn't get a job, because the jobs didn't materialize. And the ones that did were not 
you know, sufficient to sustain life for the most part. But all of that going outside Atlanta even to hire people in droves is happening now if you follow contracts that are being let with the city, from the city, the county, to build anything. They're bringing in labor from outside the city all the time. And there's no legislation that requires any other kind of practice. So we have a lot to do as citizens to educate ourselves and to demand of elected officials what they have to do if they're going to continue to hold on this. I hope I didn't want it too much. I think I did. All right, so, so Ken D, she lost what the question was. It, it was. it was, how do we address this issue? Uh, aren't there going to be some jobs created now? I mean, the Braves are talking about this brand new stadium, and then they're talking about all these hotels and restaurants and shops that are going to be all around there, and everybody's going to come spend money. We're talking about <laughs> low-wage jobs yeah. that are going to be permanent. The other jobs are temporary. But we don't need jobs. We need careers. People don't need to work for a month, two or three months, a year, and then go back on Social Security or whatever they draw. We need careers. People need to be able to take care of themselves for a working lifetime. And we cannot continue to just accept jobs. There are not going to be any jobs. There are not going to be any jobs. Uh, unless we, the community, take a stand and say we want training in career fields, not jobs. Keep your job, bring career fields. Well, it, it, it's my understanding not only are they not bringing the jobs, but the jobs are temporary. Because I do remember during the electric side, the only people who were hiring were the temporary agencies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's why they were doing well. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is the listening to you guys talk, not only are they not providing jobs, but they're actually eliminating jobs. I mean, when you do talk about Cobb County, uh, less than a year before they decided to come with this stadium, what was it, uh, almost 200 teachers uh, were laid off mm -hmm. or, or cut through attrition. Uh, we're talking about schools, we're talking about uh, just, just public services all around, you know, where those jobs are eliminated. And then you're promising, you know, 100, well, what was it, 86,000 jobs, you say? 84,000. Well, how, how many were eliminated before they even promised those? Oh, yeah. Jobs? And that's the situation with housing as well. Okay. We had 10,000 units. We had 10,000 units of housing that was destroyed and it, you know, to make way for the Potemkin village that was built right on the pathways. And it was ludicrous how people were controlled, even the traffic was controlled, and the media were bust from place to place. So they wouldn't get behind the, the, the set, you know, the Potemkin village and see what was really back there. So we were the best game in town for the news media because they wanted to see what was really happening. And that's, we still suffer from that. that we, you know, we brought that up and we got a lot of negative now. I want to raise just one other issue um, before we have to close up this session. And, and, and listeners, we will be talking about this again next Monday with another set of guests. One of the things that also seems to me when I'm looking at what's happening in Brazil, and uh, I saw the huge police presence, and I remember the huge police presence uh, as well during the Olympics and any other time there's a big event. But we're talking about a militarized police presence. We're not just talking about your friendly looking cop on the corner that's going to give directions when you're lost. Um, and it seemed to me that one of the other things that was the legacy of the 96 Olympics uh, was this repressive legislation which essentially criminalized anybody who looked poor uh, from downtown. And it seems to me that this is similar to what's happening in Brazil and you want to raise, you know, that there's Greece and all, of, all the uh, cities and countries that have had these big events that took literally billions out of public coffers that could have been used for real needs, uh, for sort of some sort of splashy one time, or even if it's used multiple times, it's still not an essential premium to a community's life. I wanted, if you wouldn't mind, Anita, to talk a little bit about that repressive legislation that still exists today. Well, it, again, it was a dress rehearsal for more. I mean, there were three infamous ordinances that were passed in the five years leading up to the games from 91 to 96. 
and we took them on and got a federal <laughs> in court. We we got a federal injunction of restraining order on the two days before the opening ceremony. So you can imagine how popular we were. But we did get a federal judge to say these the, these arrests have been made without probable cause and to restrict one of the ordinances. That Could was, you describe those ordinances? Yeah, one of the ordinances was you you were you were not allowed to be in. A, the word was remain in a parking lot unless you had a car parked there. Remain, like put your toe in the parking lot. And we, we actually filmed stings of police officers waiting in the parking lots to, for a homeless person to walk across and then arresting them. So that happened. Now, the job uh, impact of that is people who are arrested for ordinance violations, once they've been arrested multiple times, can go to jail for six months. It almost becomes um, a, a felony in in that process, and then they can't get jobs and they can't get housing. So everything that happened that was oppressive and repressive from the police point of view during the games again just sort of picked up steam after the games were over. And I can remember articles in in the AJC where now that we've taken our city away from those vagrants and obstacles they call them and worse names, we need to hold on to it. So another slew of repressive ordinances came along and there were so many service provider homeless agencies who would go and testify in favor of them because they were dependent on city money and they were held hostage to that money. That the, the ordinances were, well the deal was done before we even knew about them. So more and more ordinances have been passed, and now, you know, people with records, almost, I guess, 60% of the men who, who spend the night on any given night with us have records, and they are only ordinance violations. Like, they're not uh, crimes of person or taking. They're not they're crimes. They're, they're quality of, we call them, no, we don't, they do. Quality of life ordinances is for the quality of life of other people who don't want to see homes. I'm going to let uh, Ken finish up on this. Are, are you getting any sense in Cobb County about how this will impact people's rights to protest? I certainly know about that commission meeting where oh, nobody got to say no. <laughs> so let's, if you, you have two minutes to talk about this. You have to fill out and I'll do it sheet of paper and pass it in and then they pick who they want to speak and they know who to pick and who not to pick. But on the issues that you were talking about, over the past several years, Cobb County has taken away, has destroyed all the public housing in Smyrna and Marietta. And they relocated those people outside of those two major cities. So they were opening the door to do what they wanted to do with this Brave Stadium. There's going to be a lot of relocation, especially on Windy Hill Road. Uh, from Windy Hill, going down Car Park way up to the stadium, those apartments down there that are now serving certain people are going to be upgraded. Those people are going to be pushed out. Yeah. It's all systematic. Yeah. I am so sorry. We are out of time. I told you all this was going to be a great conversation. You got a second. And uh, well, you said we will. And we do have a second uh, session next uh, Monday. So please tune in. I want to thank our guests, Anita Beatty, Ken Howell, and uh, tune in again next week. And make sure you start uh, pledging next uh, Monday here at WRG. Diane signing off. Stay strong. <laughs>